Hey, Sean. Can you remember Chip of Flicker? Right? Hi, Ed. Chip of Flicker. Just need basically cut down the box and put the, the tube. I have the label ready to go. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll grab the tube and run the saw real quick before I go live. Yeah. Um, the Mabel's right uh, back in the office or in the, sorry, in the mechanical room. So look up to the left. Hey, Mark. See our volume, man. How are you? Hi, Ed. <clears throat> Everything good? Your volume? Do I have volume? All right. How are you, Mark? Can you hear me? Let's see, gallery view. Okay. Mark, is your volume okay? Hmm. Where's Anderson? Hey guys. Hi Anderson. How are we doing? All right, Anderson, can you hear? Yeah, I got you. You got me? I'm not hearing you. You're not hearing me? Mm, it doesn't see. say you're muted, though. I'm not hearing Mark either. Mark, can you hear me? I uh, just, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing anybody. I had to turn my speakers up on my volume. Mark, Check. are you hearing me? Check your speakers. Let me see. I can hear you, Anderson. Can you hear me? Anderson, are you Yeah, there? I got you just fine. Yep. Huh. I can't hear you, but... John, do you do something to this that... Yeah, it wasn't, though. Oh. Now I lost Ed. So far, I can't hear anybody. Um... I can hear you. You can hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Go into system preferences. Uh, the Apple. And then go to sound. Head. There. Okay, so, yeah, that should be right. Do you want output to be internal speakers and input microphone? So we go to input. And you if you want the mic, yeah. But I don't know why. Yep. I'm... Can you hear me now? Check volume on your speakers. Yeah. Are you still here? Can you hear us? Inputs coming. Go back to output. Output. No, you don't want that one. Dell Display Port. I want that. Hmm. Well, wait to zoom. Is there are any settings in here? I can see. Sue, can you hear me? Try and plug in the microphone so you can get speakers. Unplug it? Yeah. All right. Well. 
Oh, must be my microphone that's causing a problem because I can hear it now. Yes, uh, I'll keep it simple. We can hear you, but you can't hear us. Yeah, something's weird when I plug, plugged in the microphone, but it worked before, so we'll just go without it. Um, hi, Sue. So we're just waiting on you. Yep. How you doing? Um, <clears throat> get going. How's, so is everyone basically at home, it looks like? Yeah. Yep. Yes. So is everything normal or getting to normal with you guys or? We really haven't been these days. <laughs> yeah, we really haven't been shut down that much in Texas. So uh, where I live, we've only had 40 or 50 cases and the grocery stores have stayed open and uh, go sailing on a fairly regular basis with the people I know. Yep. Hey, Chip. What's up, Anderson? How are you? Hey, Ed. Hey, Mark. Hey, hey sir. Hi, Chip. How you doing, Chip? Hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I guess it's... Yeah. Uh, well, I guess it's, it's one minute till, so we don't have to start right away. But um, so, um, you know, basically the idea is we're just going to talk and see if you guys can share with what's going on in the sailing world. Um, I know Mark made some comments about um, kind of the judging side of things. You know, Anderson said he's not doing as much PRO work these days, but um, that's okay too. Um, you know, just other perspectives and, you know, just, you know, make it, you know, let us know what's going on and what you think's going on and what you can share and what what are some ideas for, you know, as we start to be able to sail, you know, what what you can do. I know Chip mentioned something. He was working on a PR or a race racing light, you know, type of thing. So, um, you know, some ideas to be safe to get people out on the water. And so uh, maybe we can start with um, – I'll, I'll just introduce you all real quick and then maybe we'll I'll introduce Chip last and he can mention that and then we can all kind of go in and take the lead of those types of things. Um, so why don't we, I've kind of done, I'll try to do things alphabetical. So Mark, why don't you just introduce who you, who you are and, and, um, and kind of what you're working on these days. Uh, Mark Foster, I'm a international race officer. National race officer and a national judge. Most of the guys I've been associated with have been canceled. Uh, not really doing anything till maybe September. In the meantime, I've been working with a company, uh, talking to them about a new starting system so that we'll actually be able to get rid of the U uh, and black flags because it'll be electronic and they think they can have the timing or the distance control down to 10 centimeters, four inches, and control that so that uh, every boat will be then notified at the right time. They're taking the time while everything's slowed down to try and get that system up and running and, and something that they can validate and have for people to use it. And it'll be reasonable enough so that a event can afford to either rent or own a set of the equipment. Awesome. Um, let's go with Anderson next. I think that's alphabetically next. <laughs> yeah, Anderson Reggio. I'm a national race officer, but uh, as you rightly said, I haven't really been doing all that much of uh, race management recently. Uh, I'm currently working employed for American Magic for the Cup campaign, uh, managing the testing for the program uh, on the water. And uh, when we're off the water, as we are currently, uh, working with a lot of our design team to uh, make sure that our priorities are in order for next time we're fortunate enough to get out on the water whenever that'll happen to be. Looks like uh, not until New Zealand uh, for, for us now. So a little bit of a holding pattern for us at the moment. Yeah. Awesome. But Mark mentioned the uh, electronic stuff. I, I wonder if actually we were speaking with the same people, Mark, we should uh, chat about that offline. Cause I was just having that same, same conversation just uh, a week and a half ago. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. All right, Sue. I'm Sue Riley um, in Connecticut. Um, 
I'm a regional race officer, a judge, an umpire. Um, as of right now, I don't have anything that's technically been canceled. Everything has been rescheduled right now. Um, I know the nude regattas, as far as I know, are still all on the books, but have pretty much been moved to the end of August to beginning of September. Um, Big J24 event was moved to later on in the year. Um, we'll see what happens. I know Connecticut, you can use your boats. You're limited to a maximum of five people. Um, I know when we've gone out recently, we keep it to four and everybody's masked, which actually would make racing a little difficult, but um, nothing really on the schedule though. I'm actually kind of thinking it's probably going to go back to being more like college sailing with a race committee with one person in the boat, three minutes starting sequence, whistles. I mean, with tape recorders and a go tape recorder and a GoPro, uh, you could actually pull this off. But I think everything's going to have to be local to start because, I mean, just look at what's required and what's recommended in different parts of the country, and it's all over the map. Okay, and Chip Till. Yeah, my name's Chip Till. I'm based in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm a regional race officer and currently actively working on my national uh, race officer certification. Um, I've done tons and tons of work with Mark, and actually Mark's been one of my great mentors through this whole process. Um, and I'm also the chair of race management for my RSA, which is South Atlantic. Yacht Racing Association, commonly known as SARA. And as a race management chair, I was tasked, my committee and myself I were tasked on putting together this concept of what we would call race committee light. And so, um, so my group put together some really, really good ideas. And basically, like Sue said, it's, it's basically running regattas as a, you know, you would say college style or, or high school style where it's, you know, Appendix U, three minute starts, there's no flags other than maybe the individual recall flag and a orange, you know, line flag. And um, you just run it really, really bare bones. Um, and uh, all that information is up on the SARA website under the race management tab. So feel free to go and, and take a look at that resource. Um, our race management committee also put together another um, presentation on best practices on how to run pursuit races. So that's another good um, resource for folks to go to the South Atlantic Yacht Racing Association um, race management tab, to pick that stuff up. So I think what it sounds like is, you know, we're gonna have to start this from the grassroots level, you know, local club racing and maybe get that back. Um, Sue, Kind of talk real quick about what you just mentioned with, um, you know, trying to run things with one person, um, GoPro, less flags, three minute things. You know, what would your scenario be if you're going to start a suggestion for like a local club that, you know, is maybe smaller? Um, kind of for like casual racing, I can see having one drop mark race committee boat. Um, having an orange flag, using government marks, three minutes starting sequence. Um, I like when I'm calling a starting line, I tape my tape recorder right to the start line pole. And before a minute before the start, put it on record. Now I don't have to touch it. It'll record everything I say. Um, with the three minute start, the only flag you really have to worry about is OCS or uh, general recall. Um, as far as a GoPro is concerned, I'd use it more, I think, for the finish line because you just need to keep track of where the boat are, especially if you have a clump that come into a finish and you can use the GoPro as a backup. Um, again, use the tape recorder to record your finishes. might take a while to get your scores posted because somebody's going to have to enter it into um, a computer or scoring program, but I mean, for fun weekend races or Wednesday night beer can races, if people just want to get out on the water, probably going to start with single hand boats or family double hand boats like JYs or lasers or 
something like that. But I mean, you, you get enough sailboats out in the water, and they're going to race anyway. So. Yep. No, I agree. Um, Anderson, with what you guys are doing, obviously at a higher level, you're also talking about not very many boats. Um, is there anything you've learned that you can share that, you know, obviously it could be toned down with, with what we're talking about here, being able to keep things simple, but still be um, pretty accurate and pretty. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy for me. The only races I've run in the last year are for one boat. <laughs> But the uh, yeah, it doesn't get much simpler than that. <laughs> but you know, I, I think for for everything that, that that we're doing now in our process of trying to get ready for the next cup, it's it is we are working really hard to try to make it so that the on the water operations are as simple as possible. And and we're trying to we're obviously fortunate to have a lot of uh, technology at our disposal. But you can you can see it relatively quickly going the path where as you incorporate more and more technology into race management, the quantity of people that are required to be on the water to run it will, will go down. Now, for, as Sue rightly mentioned, as you go more and more into the, the sort of, not uh, the, the recreational style that, that racing will likely take on as we come out of all of this, um, you, you start with one end of the, of the spectrum and you can do it with true bounds as Sue just described. But even as we start to come further and further out of all of this, I think the, the trickle down of technology into the options that we've got um, are, has, has tremendous potential. You know, we, uh, for, for the way that we operate uh, uh, at the cup level, we're, there's uh, GPS transponders on every single one of the buoys. And the race managers have the option to look on a chart plotter right in front of them and see where each of the marks are and where each of the marks are supposed to be. Well, it doesn't take you long to, to see how you can take that style system and make it relatively simple for, uh, and affordable for an event where the race officer could be sitting there and have the chart plotter in front of them at any event across the country and know where their buoys are supposed to be versus where they exactly are. And suddenly you don't need to have one mark boat stationed at every single mark making sure that the buoys are holding on to the location. You're starting to cut down on the, the assets and the quantity of people. It's those sort of patients that I think will be required, especially if we're in a situation where social distancing and, and quantity of people on boats ends up being limited for potentially quite some time. Yeah. You know, have you guys, um, how many of you guys have worked with the Marxist Podcast? guys? The mark set bots. Have you guys worked with them? I've not yet. I'm familiar with them, but I've not yet worked with them. No. I'm familiar with them, but I haven't actually done anything with them yet. So one of the things that we've talked to them about is is this type of thing, and and really a lot of Sue's situation where, you know, one person can run everything, including the mark, and so it's it's an iPhone based situation where you can move the marks when you need to and um i know obviously the biggest thing with with all of technology is keeping the cost down and so you know they're creating leasing packages which is pretty cool and so we're going to try to see if we can make it work um which they've done sale gp and so obviously they've they've got some of the things working so it's a pretty cool concept to be able to kind of run everything from a, from one spot um so as we get I think with the technology that we currently have with the I starts, I think the current the technology we have with the I start, and we can still use that, which takes away a lot of people on the committee boat, and uh, keeping it simple, whether it's a three minute start or our normal flag start. Uh, there's nothing to be said that you can't have a pin that becomes the lured mark and the weather the signal boat. In my case, I had a 20 foot well craft. They could do 30 knots upwind and we would start them and I would take off upwind with the weather mark in the back of the boat and get there before they did and sit up there and wait. If the wind shifted, I'd move it. They'd go down around the, through the gate and I'd run back down, finish them and we'd start another race. So, so it was literally ran a 10 boat J24 regatta by myself. So you can do it and sometimes it's a struggle, but uh, everyone sort of understands it. 
you're not going to be signaling a change. You're still just going to go to an orange mark, exactly. and it's going to be upwind. Yeah, and you got get rid of some of the the nuances and all the rules, and recognize that there is no redress. There, uh, there's no kind of going to be a protest hearing. If you foul someone, do your circles. If you don't, or buy someone a beer. However, you want to solve the problem, but uh, recognizing that we can run races with limited numbers of people. And the biggest part about it when you try and run four or five starts on one course and have long marks and short marks, you're going to have to have some other people, especially if it's a PHRF or a handicap race where timing is going to take a, an issue, be an issue to record all the times properly. Yeah, exactly. So, and for the scoring, we generally just don't have the score anywhere on the boat anyway, just because it's too much confusion. So we take a picture and text it to them and they score from, I literally had people score from a city 300 miles away uh, as I sent them a text. So uh, they were happy to stop their day and spend 10 minutes to score the race and come back in. So. Well, and I like the idea Sue says with the GoPro. The other, um... with, with the GoPro where you literally, you could just, if you use your phone or the GoPro had wireless or whatever to your phone, you could literally just shoot the, the boats finishing to that score that's somewhere right. anywhere in the world and then they could just score everything as well. Sure. True. Yeah, they could they could take the times and, and control all that. Well another, another nice well, another little trick I learned that makes a whole lot of sense when you're doing handicap racing. Um, I know it came out of a local club in Connecticut who shall rename who shall remain nameless. Um, but if you start a tape recorder prior to the boat, first boat finishing in a handicap, and when that boat finishes, you say what the time is. Now you leave the tape recorder running. So it's running until the last boat finishes. And if you need to go back and do times, you can time it from the first finisher after because you've got it all on tape. Well, yeah, and you can even just yeah, literally stick your watch up into the screen um, to make sure it's clear as well. Um, so I don't know. I think I might be more inclined, though, to have the GoPro not looking down the finish line so much as looking maybe three to four boat lengths before the finish line. So if you have clumps coming in, you get a look at something on the boat or a sound number on the boat as they're coming in. So whoever's siding the line, now you can do outside, inside, middle, and you can look at four boat lengths prior and figure out who it was, I think a lot easier. Yeah, if you turn, turn, the, camera over, if you yeah, turn the camera upwind doing, on a downwind finish, for instance, you get the yeah. boat in frame for a lot longer. Yeah. I mean, usually when I'm running races, especially if there's a lot of boats, I'll send someone to the very front of the committee boat and I ask them just write down what you see. They don't have to be in the right order, just what the sound numbers you see in approximately the position that you think. And if you lose a boat, you can go back and, oh, well, there they were at that moment. So you can get a much better idea of where they were, especially with handicap racing when you're dealing with tons. Yep. Now with, um, with one design racing, how much are you putting time down in results? It depends on how many people are on a boat. If, I ha if I'm dealing with a, with a race committee that normally does handicap racing and they're used to taking the times, let them take the times, we get them for everybody. Um, otherwise, definitely the first finisher and definitely the time of the last finisher. And then if I have time, I'll pop them in in the course of doing finishes if we get times for them. And it, it depends on the event. Local frostbite, I'm not taking any times. Right. Um, major championship, I'm taking every time. It's hard to look at your watch with a cocktail in your hand when you're calling frostbite finishes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you have to have it with frostbite. It's coffee, Anderson. It's coffee. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So if it looks like, you know, September, October, or maybe August, definitely September, October racing, um, are you seeing everyone like getting crammed into that area and are we going to have issues finding PROs? That's the concern off of a call we've had that uh, 
not only PROs, but judges, and that sometimes they may have to relax some of their requirements for both of those to accomplish what they need to accomplish and or uh, deal with local PROs versus when a class wants an outside PRO to come and get involved. Because I do think a lot of guys are going to end up on top of each other. I just got an email that said U.S. Sailing has uh, canceled all their U championships for the year. So they're instead of postponing and they were trying to postpone them, they just finally just canceled them all. So I think you're going to see a number of them that you're going to have the problem with too many regattas lined up on top of each other and you're going to run out of assets to, to make them happen. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, I was talking to an international judge last night about a upcoming event and, and he was telling me about how there's, uh, like Mark said, potential ways that they could use some technology and maybe use some hybrid type, um, put on some hybrid type hearings, you know, if there's protests and things like that and have, you know, judges kind of on standby, if you will, into potentially a Zoom session like this um, where they could hear testimony and, and so forth and so on and take facts and, you know, Zoom with the competitors. And maybe you have, you know, if it's an international event, you have, you know, two or three judges in the room and then the other two or three, um, you know, available through technology. Yeah, I think that's something that I, I've heard talking about even before this is, you know, from a jury standpoint, um, you know, what if you have one person on site and then you have three or however many people you need on Skype, that way, you know, if they're needed, they get involved. And if they're not, you know, you don't have to pay for the expenses of traveling and hotel and food and, and many other things. And so I think this is an opportunity to maybe jump on that and test it because, you know, we're going to have some regattas that are going to need an asterisk, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, sure. And, you know, the, some other things that, that have been discussed, I had a meeting yesterday with the, um, the winter uh, J70 series uh, organizing authority down at Davis Island in Tampa. And, you know, some of the things that have been discussed is um, maybe eliminating the official notice board that's, that's actually hung up and maybe just using yacht scoring for all communications. And that way people don't congregate near the official notice board and, you know, kind of limit, eliminate things like that to just, you know, help out with the entire effort of social distancing. And that's been done in a number of places where you don't have all the competitors at, at one yacht club, but they're spread out over three or four yacht clubs. So I think that also just requires you in the sailing instructions to put in that you're going to have to notify the signal boat as additional requirement that you intend to protest so that the signal boat thing tell the jury to start rounding people up because they're not going to be available and maybe literally midnight for a judge that's in Europe for a protest that's on the East Coast and one in the morning for one that's on the West Coast. So. Yeah, certainly for major regattas that would have to happen. But I, I would say like either Mark or, or Sue maybe said is, you know, for local stuff, handle it on the water, settle it on the water, do your circles, do your turns and just, you know, deal with it on the water so that, you know, we don't have to have hearings and have those requirements and, you know, have people congregated together and deal with it on the water and, you know, we'll just go, out, go sailing and have fun. What's your comfort level to being able to do protest meetings and things like that over Zoom and that type of thing? Are you guys all comfortable with that, especially if it's, you know, no other option? Yeah, they're, they're just getting used to, but I don't see why, why it couldn't happen. Yeah, I don't see why it couldn't happen. And it's better than not offering anything. Yeah. The only, my only concern is you do see habits and facial expressions and other issues that are brought up when certain comments are made or questions are asked and you can see people and read them as they're making their replies to a question. So sometimes you can see that that you might not be able to see in a Zoom, but at some point it could become that. And I think it's getting more common, especially now that everyone's getting so used to doing Zoom meetings or conference calls that this could be a way to 
it happens quite a bit in the future because one of the largest expenses for an international regatta is flying judges around and housing them and feeding them. Yep. Sue, from and, someone who runs a, a series of regattas being the nude regattas, I mean, would this be something with the jury especially that would make your life a lot easier to be able to kind of have the same people for every regatta but not have to bring them there? Um, actually, the nude regattas are, are a little bit different when it comes to that because we basically are a hosted organization. So we go to a yacht club. The yacht club actually supplies the race committee. The yacht clubs supply the judges and everything else. So it's that's all done locally. Um, if they're all happy with it, we're all happy with it. So I just, I mean, playing devil's advocate a little bit here, I just worry about people recording the hearings and possibly not being happy with what the outcome is and throwing it up for discussion on certain unnamed websites. <laughs> but I mean, that's absolute worst case scenario. I mean, if everybody's going back to the same club, I mean, a porch with everyone six to 10 feet apart could work also. I mean, yeah. if, again, on the local, on the local I mean, level. I think I mean, more for your casual beer can type. There's race. still value, you know. I, I think the 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 solution could potentially lie in having one person representative in on site, and then the other jury members or or protest committee members joining by Zoom. So at least you've got the one person who regulates the computer to make sure it's not that things aren't being recorded, and one person to to sit there, as Mark said, and make sure that they're picking up on any body language that that might or might not be relevant um and then you have the rest of the the protest committee join in uh remotely i think you might you might be onto something at least in in having it partially done in this manner yeah no i think that's definitely you know these are times that we can try it and you know and so that's obviously gives us you know something right now because people are getting comfortable with it whether it's just chatting with their their um you know, family or that type of thing, or if it's, you know, meetings and, and others. Um, from a world championship standpoint, you know, what could happen, you know, from that side of things that keeps it valid or maybe you would maybe write it in Well, we'll try it this year, knowing that that might be the only way to get that event off. They, so far, the only ones I'm involved in, everything I've been involved in has been canceled. The 22s, the J22, J70, and J24s have all been canceled. Uh, the Melges 24s moved theirs to Miami, and that's still up in the air. Uh, if they can make that happen or not. And Miami's concern is because currently an air ticket from Europe to Miami is three to $4,000 because no one's flying. So all of a sudden, that's a big impact if you've got to bring in everybody from around so that's what i was talking about sometimes maybe the class may have to change their uh, requirements and recognize that there may be enough jury and international jury to pull that together but they may not have the international uh, dispersion they need to actually fill the rule book so they're gonna have to work on making a, a, amendments to that and getting that accepted by the class and by maybe by world sailing if uh, it requires their approval to change the makeup of international jury. Yeah, and I think from the recording side of things, um, the good news is, is it'd be the jury that'd be coming in by Zoom and not the, obviously our competitors would most likely be able to be there and you can have them spread out enough. Um, so that's a good side. We have some people saying, yeah, you could just, you could also write into the instructions that no one can record the Zoom or that type of thing, that recordings can't be used later on. And, um that's obviously something here let me see um i think so one of the big things that happens is when you do have a major regatta uh the bandwidth that a yacht club is usually fine for their members on a random basis but you start putting 40 50 70 100 people in there uh, the bandwidth gets a little bit dicey uh, so you may have to make sure that the event has enough bandwidth and a private channel to make that Zoom call happen and not be fighting with every 
the general public for the, their bandwidth. Just like now, my neighborhood is normally 70 or 80 gigs download speed. Now it's at 30 all the time because everyone's on it. Yeah, I understand that we struggle because we're, we never get 30 even. So, <laughs> you know, we definitely struggle. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think we all have to think outside of the box and, you know, Mark, is there something you can share more with us about this uh, starting system that can be within 10 centimeters? Yeah, the guys haven't developed in there. Uh, it's some of the guys that do race instruments. So they're pretty good about, uh, they're tr trying to get the system that um, use it, Anderson y'all are using, but without all the telemetry and all the setup stations. So uh, they think they can keep their GPS reading often enough with accelerometers and direction changes so they can keep the idea where the boat's actually going versus where it's been, which the GPS generally tells you where you've been, not where you're going. Uh, they, with that system, they'll be able to put a dot on the signal boat and a dot on the pin boat. Uh, you'll have a, a red light and a green light on the system or something like that. And clearly, whoever's over early, it will, no, it will notify you after a predetermined penalty phase, as it were. Uh, which may be 30 seconds after the start, your light will turn red and you're over early and you need to come back until it turns green. Um, it can happen that literally at the time of the start, but at some point you have to say, okay, you've got to have a little skin in the game and uh, it's going to be a lot faster than me writing it down and calling it on the radio, so you'll still be ahead. But we should be able to get rid of the all the other flags if this happens. And they think it's something that's going to happen. I think it's going to be something that for most regattas, uh, it will be reasonable enough that they can make that happen. Stan Honey told me he could make it happen at any regatta I wanted to for $250,000. <laughs> that's kind of out of the ballpark. These guys are probably going to be able to do it for uh, less than that, obviously a lot less than that. They haven't come up with a pricing scheme yet of how they're making it work, but they are in the process of, of getting it put together and they're using this downtime when people aren't buying instruments from them to uh, work on this project. It's exciting to have because if it gets to the point where we can stick it on an Opti, all of a sudden a hundred boat Opti fleet is very doable and it will take away the skill set I think required by race committees to call the line and be so good at it. Uh, so I think it'll make a lot of race committees capable of running bigger events without having the expertise of trying to call a line. It also can be used by turning off everyone except the two or three people that are in the protest. So you can have their exact position as they come in. You can find out where the, the zone is. You can find out when they tacked and how the boats reacted. Uh, and it also is going to be set up so that when they cross the finish line, it records that, it records that time, and automatically uploads it to the scoring program. We don't need people. So it's going to take a lot of different race committee functions away or, you know, uh, modernize them and, and make them more autonomous so that it takes away some of that through what you talked about, about I'm missing a boat or where to go. When you're finishing 100 plus boats, you always miss one or two, no matter how, how good you are. Then you score them wherever you think they were and then let them come back and fight their way back up to where they said they want to be. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like you were talking to to different people than than I, but it sounds like it's a similar path uh, program. The, the the gentleman, the the people that I was speaking with were talking very similar technology. They didn't they didn't flip the two hundred fifty thousand dollar number, uh, but they were they're very much in the development phase of of something quite similar, uh, and talking about having a transponder on the signal boat and a transponder on the on the buoy, and actually talking about if everybody has um, has it dialed in correctly with a device on their individual boat, you can broadcast those positions to the fleet. So then the fleet now knows exactly where the starting line is and exactly how far they are from that line. You get rid of the need of all the boats to have to worry about pinging the end of the line and any error that might be uh, put in place uh, by having them ping on their own individual yachts. 
and then uh, it does allow you the opportunity, as you rightly said, to to see rather quickly uh, who's over, who's not. Um, the one the one question that I threw back to the to the people that I was speaking to was how they would handle a situation if a transponder fails. And where we sort of came back to, and, and I'm not sure what you guys would think about it, was that you know the the human eye would always be able to to overrule. Like if uh, if you saw a boat that was clearly over that was not on the list that got populated by the automated system, you could add that boat to the list, but you couldn't go, the, you wouldn't want to go the other way as a race officer. If the system tells you that the boat's over, you're defaulted to that. It, it comes up with a few little bit of subtleties as to how you would have to work that in, uh, in conjunction with the system that, that we operate off of. Um, but I liken a lot to sort of calling ball strikes, you know, 15 years ago when they came up with a little box that tells you whether or not a pitch was inside the zone or outside the zone, everybody just deferred to the umpire and, you know, that, that, that little box was nice. There'll be this sort of, if this comes down the pike, there'll have to be a little bit of a transitionary period where we sort of hash out the good and the bad of that kind of sit until we're all going to accept whatever gray area there is in terms of accuracy. Uh, and for a short period, you still rely on the umpire to call the balls and strikes, but this will be there. And then you'll slowly transition into this full electronic system. I think it's got a, a lot of promise. And I think everybody across the whole sport would be uh, breathing a sigh of relief if we got rid of the general recall forever as a result of something <laughs> like this. Well, I agree with you. And I think that uh, I still, even though the system may have its faults and maybe someone does lose a, uh, their feedback loop. It's got. It's got to be better in our eyesight trying to figure out. Yeah. So they're going ten feet per second. You know, were you were you not over early? Think about it. Especially the fact that the the signal boat moves, the pin boat moves, uh, waves hit you. I mean, you're going back and forth a boat length. Uh, you're all over the place, and it's nothing static as on the race course. So. No, but this enables you to make it. Uh, more accurate while remaining in the static environment and simultaneously you know the the one that always plagues me is you know if I'm calling a starting line and I end up with my recorder handing me the list of boats that were over personally as a PRO I'd always love to be able to call the boat that was most over the line first you know because they're going to be the boat that's most advanced they're going to have the most distance to travel regardless you know, yep. maybe you disagree. Maybe you think that the boat that was over the line the least should be the one that's first. So that you're penalizing them the least. But, you know, I, I'd always love to be able to at least see that list sorted in some manner of who was over by the most to who was over by the least. And this automated system would be able to give you that. So, that, you know, the order in which you read off the numbers, as you would still likely be required to broadcast them over the radio, would have some more relevance to it. It's not just who happened to be closest to the committee boat end or closest to the pin end. Right. Yeah, no, I understand. I would, I, I would agree with you hundred percent on that. If the system, if they can pull it off and I think we may be talking the same guys, I think if they pull it off, it's going to be a big step forward and it's going to add a tremendous amount of simplification by the time it's said and done to the race committee and take a lot of the onus off of, calling people over early who may or may not have been over early and li listen to the redress and going through that and ruining someone's regatta when if there was a, some, an error made one way or the other. It also will allow you to get the people. And once it's done, I think all of a sudden you're going to see the fleet behave much better and the, the number of people that will be over early will just be down dramatically over time to the point where eventually you're just going to be looking down all clear line all the time. If there's, if there's a level of accuracy that's 10 centimeters or even a meter, if, if everybody accepts that as the level of accuracy, then nobody has any cause to complain. Correct. About and if you take that thereafter and then go to the other end where you're talking about finishes, yeah, you, you no longer have to worry about missing boats. You know, you'd still want to have the manual verification of everything, but then you could even go beyond that to where that's automatically populating some scoring system in the cloud. And by golly, by the time the last boat's finished, the results are already there on the website, that's ready right. for people to take a look at them. Yeah. 
So, Mark, is this could this thing happen quicker if like the accuracy was a meter versus ten centimeters, or is it it's either going to work or it's not? It's not the accuracy; it's the funding. Yeah, they just need some money. Yeah. You know, they're spending money pretty quickly. They're burning through cash, and uh, so they're part of their part of the people I put them in contact with uh, are for their expertise in the field, and the other part of it was to maybe they might be. Uh, investor types. So. so I think the biggest thing with all of this is keeping I, costs. I think it's going to be fairly where they are. I think they're, yeah. Well, what makes it doable for something like the sale GP or the cup is the fact that the teams are already financially committed to having a GPS that's got an update rate fast enough and math in their processors on their boats that's needs to be accurate enough to make sure that they've already got that they know exactly where their bow is exactly where their 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 beam is um or in our case in the cup exactly where our windward foil plus some x distance outboard happens to be located because we we need to do that math um so we're already spending that expense on those high rate gps's and accurate uh instrumentation yeah i mean this is definitely pretty cool stuff. And like Mark said, and I've talked to other people, which could be similar people is, you know, it is this downtime is allowing people to work on projects that they need, that they would like to work on and not necessarily uh, want to work on because they'd rather be selling instruments and that type of thing. And so, um, you know, I think in the end we can be better because we can have this type of technology we can have the Markset bot type of technology where, you know, we could run like we the, the Markset bots they're leasing them, so you could spend a couple grand a year uh, for a, like a club that only races for three months, and they can have the GPS marks that are going to move, and then they need one person to run races, especially if they do a scenario like Sue mentions where you use the cameras and things like that. And I think that's one of the things I want to try to get out of what you know what's going on here is create the club that has a small budget program that maybe they were spending ten thousand a year but how can we get it so they spend seventy five hundred a year and make it easier and more accurate um, because i think that's the hard part for areas like us where we're in the middle of the country where you get someone to help and you know they can't really you know you can only teach them how to call the wind so well and so you need some of this technology behind you to be like, hey, the mark is here. Or a sailor could literally go go head to wind with their compass and say, hey, the weather mark needs to be at 75 degrees. And so then they can plug into the thing 75 degrees. Uh, so what are some tips from you guys for a really grassroots program to be able to do this type of thing? Like just even call the wind and call how to set a mark. I kind of ask one of the sailors to go to the middle of the starting line and go head to wind and give me what his heading is. I watch boats go by if they have wind instruments and I look and see what they're getting at the top of the rig, if at all possible. I, it varies from locations. I mean, do you have tide involved? Are you on a lake? I don't know. I guess you kind of go with your gut. Well, at some point you have to send them sailboat racing and the wind does shift. Oh, absolutely. And as a PRO yes. told me a long time ago, the same old sunburned faces always show up at the top, no matter how the wind shifts or where the puffs come from. So uh, the job is to get them started and get them out there and they'll figure it out. And I, when you look at the end of a score, end of a regatta and look at the score sheet, you see a guy with one through fives and all of a sudden he has a 15. You go down, the guy in 15th has 15 through 20s and all of a sudden he has a three. You ask somebody, say, what happened with that race? Uh, it was wind kind of shifted a little bit. Like, yeah, you can tell. So uh, I think that, you know, Sue, you're right. The wind shifts and things happen, and, you know, that's why we call it sailboat racing. That's why they call it fishing, not catching. Yep. Would you guys do a different course, like, say, a triangle course over a windward lured in a real shifty place with less experienced race committee? Or what was there some special course you would do over others? Personally, the Windward Lured is the easiest course to set up. It takes the least amount of effort to do it. Uh, depending on the class of boat, the Windward Lured can either be 
very challenging. And Etchell's in 12 knots of breeze, jives through 10 at the most, maybe seven or eight degrees, if that. Uh, J70 in almost all conditions, jives through 90, sometimes higher. So J70 is for like, put the lure mark down there someplace, they'll figure it out. And, you know, and Etchell's, you better put the lure mark where they have to jive, otherwise it's a parade. So, you know, in Anderson's case, uh, where the marks are, don't know that it's that big a difference if they're off a couple hundred feet because the speeds are going and the direction they're going. They sail through most wind shifts. Uh, they catch up with wind shifts downwind. I'm not legally allowed to talk to you about our angles, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're on foils, it's good, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Foiling is king. Yeah. If you're going two knots faster, I think you're, uh, you're okay. <laughs> cool. So how a chip in your current, you have a little bit of current in Charleston, right? What's a, what's a trick for, um, you know, setting courses in current? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll get out there and if the current's really, really, really ripping, um, you know, we can get obviously a wind reading on the committee boat that's anchored. But um, something I actually learned from, from Mark is, you know, if you know somebody in the fleet that's a good friend of yours, you know, have them come over near the committee boat. They're obviously floating and ask them to take a wind reading on their boat. And so they'll get the current influence. Um, and if I'm say, say I'm shooting 210 and they come by and they shoot, you know, 200, then I know, you know, what the current's doing and you can put the mark um, you know, the weather mark in an appropriate area to help factor in, um, you know, the current there. And I know from most of you guys, when you're running races, you tell people what the current's doing at a start to try to control, you know, your success of getting a start off. Does anyone have any tricks or just, you just want to communicate what's going on? I know sometimes in a class it seems to be a little aggressive and the current's causing issues. I'll just make a general radio announcement to the pin boat. You know, pin, be careful. We got a bunch of people charging hard. They're not aware of how bad the current's going to push them over and give them kind of, and it's not for the, the pin boat's education. It's for the entire fleet for them to sort of say, hey, slow it down. Otherwise, we're just going to do this one more time. And most of the times, they, once they hear that, they all look and you see the bow man starting to push it down and tell them to slow down and they back off enough to where you can actually get a start off. And as I said, let them go sailboat racing and figure out who's going to win. So. And little boats, if you're using a megaphone for calling over early, you pick up the megaphone and you just clear your throat in it. And it's amazing how they all kind of fall back behind the line. That's good. That and the closest boats that they're looking at your eyes as you're sighting down the line. So a lot of times you'll see the bow guy and you just look straight at him and give him one of those, as my grandson says, Papa looks. And uh, it's sort of like, uh-oh, he's looking right at me. I guess I pin his line of sight. And that, that'll slow him down just a bit. And that's all you need. You're just trying to get it to the point where you have a reasonable number that you can account for and preferably have everyone clear and let them go sailboat racing. But Sue, you're right. There's a lot of times when you just say as loud as you can, a bow number or sail number is getting really close, uh, way above your normal talking voice. And some people say, is that considered outside assistance? Well, maybe. Your, your job as a race officer is to try to make it so that the start gets off and the race is fair. You know, as long as I have no problem sharing information, as long as it's fleet wide to everybody, you know, as Mark said, you're calling the pin boat and, making a blanket statement to the pin boat. It's amazing how many people will tune in when, when they hear you start to talk about what's happening on the race course on the radio. But you know, if, you're, if you're doing that with the intention of making sure that the information is available to everybody to help make the race as fair as possible for everybody, that, that's your number one job as a race officer. Yeah. I, you know, I can, gotta, gotta get them off the starting line. I can remember the first regatta I sailed in um, that I had a PRO that talked and, you know, just communicated. And, uh, you know, it was Melgus 24 North Americans in San Francisco. And, um, 
I remember to this day. Um, and we didn't have Velocitex, but his communication was very good. And since then, you know, I, 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 I will judge, you know, you guys based on how well you communicate. And, uh, and I think that, that also, there's a big reason why you guys, I'm, you know, I respect all you guys and have brought you in because you communicate properly and, you know, you see that in the results of, of the, of the events. And, and that is communicating enough, but not too much and doing what's right for sailing. Um, one of the things that I, um, you know, Chip just started doing the J seventies down in Davis Island. And the first event, well, we almost had something really cool and unique that, that he almost ran in practice races official, unofficially because we didn't have enough wind. And he literally changed things up to just try to let people sail because there was enough wind for about half the fleet to be able to sail a little bit. Um, but not enough for everyone to sail. And so I think just thinking outside the box was, was, that was very refreshing. And um, I know a lot of you guys, you guys all do this. And, you know, I think it's more of what we need to see in sailing is just, you know, figure out the easiest way for us to all go sailing. And hopefully this next few months, you know, it'll be a lot of outside the box thinking just to make sure people can go sailing. So, um, you know, Maybe you guys can, you know, just share one way that you're going to help your club, like Mark said, you kind of already are doing it, to go sailing safely at the grassroots level right now to get races off. What's the best way to do it, you think? Mark? Just have impromptu races with nothing scheduled and recognizing you have to practice the social distancing using – uh, simplified rules. It's Joel said the weather mark's going to be up there. Just go around and come back. Uh, cut out a lot of the stuff that we write in the sailing instructions. No one reads them, and we put a lot of work into them. But there's a lot of nuances that you know. I know when I'm a sailor, I look at okay, what time we're going to start, what color the mark's going to be, what color the change is going to be, and it's got to be up when someplace. So let's just you know, start doing that. So I think just trying to make it simple so that people don't get too wound up and I think a lot of the local clubs do a lot of that already. Uh, the iStart allows a lot fewer people to be on board and uh, takes away a lot of people that you need to help keep things rolling. Um, so I think the simplicity, the simpler we can make it and back to you know as it used to be when we throw two hippity ops out there and do a rabbit start and that take off and someone would drop a mark almost when they get to the certain plus that they're far enough in advance, they drop a mark and or someone drops a mark and everyone goes around it and the race starts over. Anderson, you wanna? Uh, I think just keep it, keep it simple, keep it informal. I mean, you know, ever since boats were invented, anytime you got two of them near one another, it turned into a race. <laughs> so, you know, as long as there's people getting back on their boats again and getting out and enjoying it, uh, all the better for everybody. But I, you know, I, I think of what we have for the, the best, best recreational sailing here in Newport. You know, I think of the, the Shields Wednesday night fleet, which I am dying to get back out and enjoy before, uh, as soon as possible. And for that every week, what makes it great is that it's nothing more than one race committee boat. They drop one pin mark, uh, one pin buoy and, send us off around a bunch of government marks. I think there's going to be more and more of that in a much more informal style. And, and the, the, the first person to figure out, you know, how to set a race for Friday night when they send an invite out on Wednesday is probably going to be the person who's going to have the most boats out there to just enjoy themselves. Yep. Sue? I think hop in a ribbon go out with an orange flag and use government marks. I'm fortunate enough to live in an area there's enough government marks here and we've got a couple of little islands we can sail around and I just think that's probably going to happen on a local level before anything else. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah and precisely what Sue uh, just mentioned that has happened in Charleston. Um, where they're doing like uh, pursuit style races. And I was out in my power boat last weekend and uh, um, we were riding around. I was like, just kind of saw a bunch of sailboats. I was like, oh, they're doing their pursuit race and they're going around R2. And um, so that's, 
that's, you know, already happening in Charleston and, and people are sailing around, you know, Kessel Pickney and they come up with a little course that we sail like for our leukemia cup. And um, it's been pretty successful. It's getting boats out on the water. Um, so where it may not be to, to Mark's point, you know, your traditional windward lured, high tech, big championship regatta, it might be just kind of local stuff that's, you know, around government marks and, um, you know, things like that. But the biggest thing is if we do are able to get out on a rib, like um, Sue said, and go drop a mark in the water, you know, it's just, again, like everybody keeps saying, just keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the race committee light presentation is, you know, the real opportunity that all of us have for the sport of sailing is to kind of re-energize that grassroots, local, um, you know, community uh, sailing aspect that, you know, we all started out with. So I think that's, you know, one of the things that I'm most excited about. So I have a, I have a, basically a question, number one, you know, there, a lot of people are really liking this discussion. And so the question is, can we cr recreate a Facebook group or, a, um, you know, an online group of some sort um, that'll allow, you know, questions for PROs um, to, you know, ask questions and have you guys and other PROs ability to, you know, to reply. Um, my suggestion is we create a Facebook group that's closed and we can just have some, you know, simple questions like, you know, are you a PRO and where and, and that way we're, and then we have to accept them in. And, and the reality is, is just to keep, you know, randoms out of it. But just so we can create a, a group that if someone has a question like we're having here, they can ask and, and you guys and we can grow the group can answer. Um, is that something you guys would be okay with? You obviously only answered if you're jumping on, but you'd get the questions um, to you. Is that something you guys be interested in or a different format that we could do? And I think that's a good idea. What I'd like to see happen is that to go through Taryn Teague, who's chairman of the U.S. Race Management Committee, and so that she starts that group and, and has, and then can set that up, and uh, that would be helpful. I'm not on Facebook, so I would contribute to it. Um, so, but I think that would be a good idea. And maybe that's something that we probably ought to do through U.S. Sailing and the Race Management Committee itself so that they have that Facebook forum that's uh, limited to either their certified race officers or their uh, certified and ones who are trying to become certified race officers. That's probably a good, a good idea. Yeah, I think we don't want to limit it too much, but if somebody, you know, says, hey, I run, you know, I think it can grow to get those people to, be, you know, get into the system. You know, if they're just running their races at their local club that may not be a U.S. sailing club or it would be if they had this opportunity. So um, I think we can, you know, have it set up so we can um, make sure everyone's legit and that can maybe help grow the people coming up that want to be PROs. So. I can work on that with, with U.S. Sailing, no problem. Um, I think uh, yeah, no, another. Go ahead, Chip. I was just gonna say another uh, quick thing. Um, a little plug for what U.S. Sailing is doing uh, from a race management perspective is that the uh, the one day race management course is now going online. I think it's being um, beta tested right now. But, um, you know, for people that want to come, you know, on board and potential new race officers, you now will not have to jump in a plane or drive a car, you know, 300 miles or wherever to, to go and sit down in a course. But they're doing it similar to a Zoom session like this. It's partly online. There's some pre-study work um, and, some, and some other, you know, requirements. But, um, you know, the, avail the availability for that to reach out to the community now and the, the nation is an awesome, awesome um, offering, in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so we can share that on this uh, thread to try to get people to this and then, uh, and then we can, um, you know, hopefully help educate people to get to where all this information is. Um, 
So thank you everyone for joining. If you, anyone want to say anything to wrap up, but I really appreciate it. Um, we will post this for other people to look at it uh, later on on our YouTube page. Um, and, you know, any idea, any questions that are specific to anyone, I will, you know, let you guys know. And I really appreciate all of your time. Thanks, Ed, for putting this together. No problem. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. Stay, stay healthy, everybody. everyone. Take, Take care, guys. You all stay healthy. Care. Hopefully, we see you all soon on the water. Not soon enough. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not soon enough. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.